social network, improved camera, improved battery life and a faster processor. Those are just some of the things that Apple feels are worth the $649 that you will have to suck up for the latest iPhone 5 that was rolled out last night. Now, the most talked about feature, however, is the Touch ID, which maps your fingerprint. And Apple says that will allow you to keep your data more secure. That, or as privacy advocates say, this is just making the job of forensic experts just a little bit easier. So that's what we discussed today. iPhone 5 the fingerprint feature, creative or creepy. And if you think we're the only ones making a big fuss about the privacy features and security of your information, uh, well, of course, that is something to laugh about in the United States. Let's listen in to Jimmy Kimmel. Apple this morning unveiled not one, but two new iPhones which uh, this is about as close as America gets to having a royal baby, Apple unveiling new iPhone. They have a new high-end iPhone called the iPhone 5S. The S stands for shut up and give us your money. It has a better camera, uh, a longer battery life, and a fingerprint scanner because the NSA didn't have enough of our personal information. Now they will have our fingerprints too. And the coolest new feature, I think, is an app that allows you to forget that six months ago you spent $500 on a phone that is now obsolete. All right, so um, Jimmy Kimmel, Jaijit, uh, let's quickly uh, introduce our panelists. Also, we've got with us Jaijit Bhattacharya. He's, among many things, an expert on IT policy and e-governance. Jitin Jain, who is the co-founder of the Hackers Conference and a cybersecurity panelist. Uh, Gopal Sankar Narayanan, who's an advocate at the Supreme Court. And from Bangalore, we're joined by Matthew Thomas, who's a governance and social justice activist. So, Jaiji, uh, Jimmy Kimmel there, of course, was doing a stand-up comedy. He was saying, what more can they want? They've already, NSA has already got most of your information. And, uh, you know, the last thing that was probably left was our fingerprints, and that too the iPhone will now take. Right. Is that really that funny? Um, it's definitely not funny. You know, um, the point is you can't stop the march of technology, so you need to have these features in. And this is not the first time that a mobile phone has this feature. There was Motorola, which had this kind of feature. There was a South Korean firm called Pantech, which had this feature. What makes it uh, more dangerous now is that it's integrated to a smartphone. The earlier phones were not smartphones. And if you look at other devices, the other personal devices such as laptops, which had such a feature where you did have a fingerprint authentication system, but they were not taken up by the consumers. And the laptops discontinued having these kind of uh, features in the laptops. So the question is, why is it that we are bringing this feature in? For sure, there are value to it. For example, if you want to make a payment and you want to use your mobile phone to make a payment, especially in an Indian situation where people are not very literate, putting your fingerprint in and allowing that payment to happen is good. You can use that phone to perhaps open your door by putting your fingerprint on the phone and the phone communicates to your door and opens up. That's a good part of it. But it's a scalpel paradox. A scalpel can be used to do yeah. good things, but it can also be used to do many things which are not so good, which is why the comic stand-up is not so comic in real life. Because once your fingerprint is gone, that's a most essential part of your identity, you can then start linking yourself up with everything else, going back to even Aadhaar. So if you get your fingerprint from your phone and you get another piece of data which also has your, got your fingerprint, you suddenly have your bank account, you got your positions, you got every detail of yours over there. Uh, which can be sucked out and used centrally and given the powerful amount of data analytics that we can do, the power of the computing that we have, we can find out unimaginable amount of information that even the person themselves will not remember. Will not remember. You know, uh, Jitin, I just want to bring you in. A lot of the talk on, on social media today, uh, you know, a lot of the tweets have basically said that, okay, look, Apple is saying that they're not going to upload this feature onto their iCloud server. It's only going to be restricted to that piece of hardware, your iPhone. So what's wrong with that? No, what Apple, what Tim Cook said was that, you know, the fingerprints will not be uploaded and saved on a central server. So what he meant to say that they will be no, uh, not a, you know, huge repository of fingerprints of millions of Apple users. But the reason why he made a statement was that there are a lot of allegations, you know, and the proven allegations that Apple was in fact supplying raw data of the personal data of users to the prison under the prison program to NSA. And why social media is debating this is because it's a million dollar question. Will Apple now start providing fingerprints, your fingerprints, my fingerprints to NSA now for further spying? Now that's the, that's the issue why Tim Cook addressed that, okay, we will not have a central server where we'll, we'll store all these fingerprints. But you, you see, whether he stores a fingerprint on a central server or not does not solve the question. The, the question is, does Apple have the access to the fingerprint on your phone? Yes, you do have anyways. They can anytime access any data or any fingerprint on your phone or an, any API. So that makes, that makes it as good as, you know, having a fingerprint on a central server. So tomorrow, if some NSA is to get a court order that, okay, fine, I want the fingerprint of that particular guy or, you know, these amount of citizens or the citizens of this entire country on NSA uh, records through your fingerprint mechanism, 
the Apple will have to comply. There is no way that they cannot comply because entire Apple uh, programs or uh, infrastructure is under the jurisdiction of United States government. So you're saying in what they're saying, they're actually hiding what they, they could potentially oh, do in terms of Oh, this is another NSA gimmick to collect fingerprints from across the world. I mean, why Apple has bought fingerprint, I mean, biometric scanner to the main center stage? Because, I mean, uh, are they trying to say that passwords and those five mechanisms have failed? Or are they trying to say that, will fingerprints will be more safer than all of them? All right, I'm, I'm actually just going to throw that across to uh, Matthew. Uh, Matthew, you know, one of the big worries with the launch of this fingerprinting device feature on the iPhone is that other smartphones are, to sh are sure to follow, are sure to duplicate this, and soon we'll have a flurry of smartphones in the market, all of them which will be able to basically track your fingerprints. What is the danger with the collection of these fingerprints, this biometric data? What is the danger, as Jitin is pointing out, they are certainly going to have to hand it over to the government should the government actually demand that. Thank you. Uh, the other two panelists have brought out the dangers very succinctly. Uh, there's nothing much to add to that. But I'd like to sort of uh, uh, talk about this whole idea of fingerprints as something unique and great. I think it's rather a silly idea. Let me read to you from an article which uh, appeared in The Economist and the economists uh, should know what they are talking about. It's a magazine of repute. And it specifically this article was on fingerprints and biometrics. Uh, let me read it. Thanks to gangster movies, cop shows and spy thrillers, people have come to think of fingerprints and other biometric means of identifying evildoers as being completely foolproof. In reality, they are not and never have been and few engineers who design such screening tools have ever claimed them to be so. Yet the myth has persisted among the public at large and officialdom in particular. In the process it has led especially since the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001 to a great deal of public money being squandered and worse to the fostering of a sense of security that is largely misplaced. See this whole idea of fingerprints and being unique and it's useful etc is Tommy Roth if, you may, if I may say so. Yes they are useful to some extent. As for payments etc it's ridiculous to try and pay through using your fingerprints because your fingerprints you leave it all over the place. It's like leaving your password all over the place and if in fact one of the biggest dangers I see is it will strike at the very root of the judicial system as individual fingerprints become available in various databases. I can take that fingerprint and put it onto a weapon. I can put it onto a, a bank locker and say that this person stole things from it. Fingerprints by themselves are probabilistic in nature and cannot really identify a person uniquely as the case of the Madrid bomber brought out. The database of the FBI uh, found that a person with the uh, fingerprint was in California. It finally turned out to be false. That poor man had never left, left the United States. He didn't even have a passport. He couldn't have been to Madrid to do the train bombing. The other thing I want to say is Matthew, there are just want to many ask ways you. in which... Ma Matthew, I quickly want to ask yeah. you, you're of course yeah. pointing out uh, the kind of dangers that can happen with uh, access to biometrics and yeah. fingerprinting and stuff. Is it, is, is it also possible to do yeah. profiling? Having this, uh, is it also possible to have profiling? Is it possible certainly, for the government to do profiling with fingerprints? Certainly. It, Ab certainly, you see, because if your fingerprint is your password and as uh, in many other cases this is going to be linked to, uh, they say mission convergence, it's linked to ration cards, it's linked to LPG, it's linked to uh, your bank accounts and so on, uh, your name, your caste, your date of birth, caste census, certainly it can be used for profiling. But the fundamental question is not that. Why is Apple doing it? Of course, certain surmises have come up. But I think more, more than, because that is one of the byproducts, NSA can have data. But I think it's more a gimmick. They probably are losing out market share to Samsung and they want to come out with something which uh, I think they believe will be a, uh, will be right. a game changer. Well, well, I'm sorry, I don't well. think it will. Well, frankly, uh, Matthew, why uh, Apple is doing it is uh, really anybody's guess, whether it's a gimmick or whether it's, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, the next, yeah. uh, uh, it's next unique or uh, uh, whether others will do it or not. That, of course, we'll have to wait and see. But I just want to bring in Gopal. Gopal, Kash, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a lot of, I'm looking at a lot of, uh, you know, interactions that are coming in right now. Yes. And many of them have this one thread of thought. If we have nothing to hide, what is the problem in the government or anybody else 
having our uh, uh, having our information. In fact, uh, somebody has written in saying, "I don't get the issue. Fingerprint scanners aren't bad." I say, "Put in a retinal scanner. No worries if you've got nothing to hide." Now, this someone who's written in to you, does he or she know that for several years now we're ra raising the fingerprint issue now? But for several years, we have had, you know, iCloud and they're probably using Dropbox or uh, Google Drive, all facilities in which your private SMSs and your emails and other material, private documents, etc., even copyrighted material are stored, right? Access to those, those servers primarily, because these corporations are registered in the US, they have large space there for their servers, etc., are in the US. Now, the information that they upload and save in India is available in the US under US corporates who can be arm twisted by using legal procedures in the US to divulge that information. Now is the person tweeting and emailing you aware of that? Has that person been told when he or she bought an iPhone or any other smartphone thus far that any of your cloud techniques that you use or material that you save can be used by individuals who you did not intend to divulge this information to to start with. I think that's one I immediate issue, the fact that this has been out there for a long time and governments abroad are in a position legally there to access, to access the information, information which you imagine is sitting on your phone. Yeah. That's one. Okay. Jachi, you know, what, what, just break it down very simply. What are the privacy violations? So, you know, I think a uh, very good question because uh, people uh, here do not understand privacy in the, in the sense that um, how it really hurts them. Uh, privacy is not just um, where are you driving, what movie are you watching. That's not really privacy. Well, it can be construed to be a privacy fanatic's view of what privacy is. But privacy is that if you have visited a doctor for certain problems and you don't want the world to know what that problem is, but because you checked in and because your fingerprint was captured and that gets transmitted and therefore everybody gets to know what your medical problem was, that's a privacy violation. Now you might say that I didn't do anything illegal, so I don't, I'm not concerned about my privacy yeah. being violated, but do you want the world to know what are your medical problems? Mm -hmm. Do you want the world to know where are the stocks that you have betted? If I go and know, and, and if you are a big businessman who is put in and, and is going to buy a lot of stocks, mm. I know where you're going to buy the stocks, that's also a privacy violation. So privacy violation has got multiple dimensions. And the dimensions which are going to hurt you, either economically or socially or morally, are all privacy violations. And, and that's a sensitization that has not happened in this country, also because we don't have very strong privacy uh, legislations. And that's one of the things that, he is, that Gopal is bringing in, yeah. that the laws are different, our interpretations are different, our yeah. concerns are different. For example, if Julian Assange is being targeted, yeah. is he a criminal under Indian law? He's not. Mm -hmm. But he has been denied all access to visa payment systems, MasterCard payment systems and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. His privacy is getting violated Violet. because of the interpretation of whether he is a criminal or, or, or not, not, which is under different jurisdictions. All right. In fact, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ajitin, I'm just going to come back yeah. to you in a bit. Uh, one of the things that's also being talked about is the fact that, uh, you know, there is, uh, you're going to opt out of it. You don't have to uh, take this uh, fingerprint feature at all. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the other counter argument to that is, why would you buy the new iPhone 5S in the first place if you were not going to take that fingerprint feature uh, at all. So in a sense, it is kind of take it, right? It, it Buy is. And pay us money for it. It is, it is. And, and, and I think I completely agree with, with the point made uh, regarding the fact that Indians by and large, I think, don't understand privacy at all. They don't understand possibly because it's not in a law and because we don't have a law on privacy. We don't understand. I think we are intrusive as, yeah. as a nation. We are very happy to just pop in our neighbors' houses without knocking, without asking. It's something we've grown up with. So we don't think much of personal space mm -hmm. and personal information, etc. But I think we're gradually reaching a stage where our information is going into societies which are not uh, attuned to this kind of lack of privacy, mm -hmm. right? And it's being used in manners which yes. we did not imagine. Yeah. I think because of this internationalization yeah. and because of the fact that India is so under-regulated, we have Mr. Tata's uh, petition still pending in the yeah. Supreme Court regarding privacy and we are still debating whether he has a right at all which was violated to start with. Yeah. So we, because it's all fluid and it's been fluid for now 60 years after the constitution came in and we still don't know where the privacy laws are. I think yeah. that's a major problem. I think okay. everybody is talking about this, uh, uh, you know, uh, fingerprints and iPhone. What we are forgetting minute? is that they have introduced another feature called M7 coprocessor which which will now continuously monitor your motions, uh, motion movements, your accelerometer, your movements. Even you when go. your phone is sleeping, even they will continuously track those movements. So, and the 
access to that uh, chip would be available to all third party applications also so tomorrow if nss is to track my every single movement or every every single walk yeah. they can easily do it yeah. but i want to bring one fundamental Quick, question does the privacy right is only the right of selective few in india is only ratan tata or leader of opposition arun jetli should his phone call should not be monitored or only sonia gandhi for her medical records do, do they have the right to privacy are they are we running uh, becoming a country of the right of selective few when the rights of millions of citizens are, is being violated data is being spied by nsa our government does not even question america this is the whole thing so tomorrow uh, if this all debate comes true that in nsa fact, takes away to, in fact, if nsa takes fail. away all the fingerprints what will you do will in the government fact, to defend America for the information yeah. that, that, that yeah. America was looking at of yeah. ours. Matthew, just quickly, you have 10 seconds to make your last point. Yeah, 10 seconds. You asked a very relevant question. I mean, privacy is very important. Privacy is equal to right to life. I agree to that. But something more important than privacy, you couple it with profiling. The problem with these databases and collection of data is you are not what you are. You are not Cassius as you, as you know yourself or Gopal as he knows himself. You are what the database says you are. And let me tell you a little uh, 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 fact. Ian Angel, uh, Ian Angel was a professor, is a professor in the London School of Economics. He once went to his bank and to do some transaction. He talked to his bank Ma manager. The bank Matthew, ma gave Matthew, them the account number. Matthew, I'm going to have to leave. Yeah. Matthew, I'm going to have to leave it here. I'm so very sorry, but that strong, powerful note coming from Matthew. Okay, you fine, are what your data you. says you are. Yeah, but you are and what that the exactly is says the worry. You are. Sorry, say that again, yeah. Matthew. You are what your database says. Yeah, you okay. are what the database Absolutely. says what you are. Absolutely. And That's you are exactly not what, what you are. Yeah. Right. All right. So, well, do the smartphones, in fact, uh, deserve uh, to be able to collect so much database? I hope Anin and some of the people who have written in asking us these questions about why this should worry us. I hope some of these panelists have been able to answer your questions. Uh, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here on the social network, but uh, come back again tomorrow, same time at 6.30. Goodbye for now.